If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. The Missouri General Assembly's legislative session ended a long time ago. But lawmakers are seeking to restore in-home health care services to thousands of low-income and elderly Missourians. One of the people that's seeking a solution is Representative Justin Alferman. The Herman Republican joins us on another edition of Politically Speaking, so let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, a candid conversation with the Show Me State's biggest political newsmakers. I'm Jason Merzenbaum. And I'm Joe Manis. That's Eric Greitens, Navy <laughs> SEALs running for governor, and I'm really, really glad to be on with you, Jason and Joe. I'm going to push back on these regulators. I'm doing this for the people. I was encouraged along the way, not just by my family, but by a lot of teachers and professors and knew when I was in college that I would run for office someday. We're very excited about the prospect of having some more free market solutions. Even though after the conversation, I still might not agree. We want our listeners to get a real sense of what drives these people. They're actually people with a story to tell. And welcome to the Politically Speaking Podcast, the only show about Missouri politics featuring a microphone that literally dropped (laughs) while the music was playing. And it wasn't mine. I'm Jason Rosenbaum, the... I'm Jason Rosenbaum. I'm actually the interim temporary editor in St. Louis Public Radio until they find a a, a, a permanent replacement. Joining me in studio today is... Colleague Joe Manis. I'm not brown-nosing, but so far Jason's doing a pretty good job. Oh, well, I am actually overseeing Joe. (laughs) And uh, our guest today, whose microphone inexplicably dropped right before uh, he's about to say his name... Uh, (laughs) Justin Alferman. (laughs) State representative for what what number district again? District 61. And and just remind our listeners uh, what the the boundaries are. Sure, that is uh, northwestern Franklin County. Uh, Northern Gasconade, Northern Osage County, um, uh, kind of circulating around the communities of Washington, New Haven, Herman, and Chamoy. And you're Republican. Mm-hmm. This is the second time you've been on the show, and something has happened since you were last on. You became the vice chairman of the House Budget Committee. Um, interesting side note, one of the people that you worked for politically, former state representative Ed Robb, was vice chairman of the House Budget Committee. I actually followed both Representative Alferman and then Representative Robb, although you weren't a representative then. I right. think. I think you might have been like 23, 24 or something Oh, goodness. Like no, I was younger than that. I was uh, 21, 22 whenever I, I started working for uh, Representative Rob on his reelect campaign. And uh, it's kind of come full circle. I had, uh, at that point, had no idea what the uh, Missouri budget was all about. And so, it, you know, hearing Ed almost, you know, 10 years ago uh, talking about this and now actually being a policymaker in that arena, it's... Um, it's amazing. It's very how, surreal. Amazing how things come full circle in yeah. Missouri politics. But we're going to talk about the budget first because one of the things that's been left outstanding that's from veto session that people are still talking about are reductions to in-home care for uh, thousands of Missourians. Um, if you could kind of set the table of what the situation is and why we're even talking about this, that would be my first question for you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> As you know, the the Missouri budget was um, not in a great place whenever we came into session uh, January of 2017. Um, when going through the budget process, because of you know uh, lower than anticipated revenue growth, um, over projections on spending, we had to cut about 500 million dollars out of the state's budget. When all the chips left in the, and fell, um, we had part of the budget process um, for a funding mechanism for in-home and health care was the Senior Services Protection Fund. And we were going to pay for that by um, making some modifications to the circuit breaker tax credit. Which is a property tax break for lower-income Missourians. Correct. And I think the particular modification that has actually been floated for many years is making it no longer available to renters. Is that the, is that true? That is correct. I'm glad you pointed that out because that was the recommendation from uh, Governor Nixon actually in his 2010 10 budget or 2012 budget excuse me mm-hmm. uh, was actually a recommendation proposed in his budget um, and it was suggested twice by uh, then governor nixon's own tax credit commissions um, in statute that is referred to as the property tax credit it has never made sense to me why an individual would get a property tax credit whenever you are renting a renting a uh, your your home because you don't pay property tax. Now, some people will argue that you pass that on um, in the cost of of your rent, but that credit assumes that 20% of your rent is going to pay 
for the owner's property tax. That's just that's just ludicrous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's way too high. So we went through a session. Um, that was the proposal from the House. Um, the Senate changed that to a fund sweep um, with that the governor then vetoed because he claimed that it was unconstitutional. Yeah, I mean, just to give a little backdrop on this, we've had state rep uh, uh, Deb Lavender in here uh, earlier. She's a Democrat from Kirkwood. She was one of the crafters of the fund sweep. And just so our listeners understand, what she what they did was they found dozens of bank accounts in the various state agencies and departments that had unspent <clears throat> money. And in many cases, these were accounts that were not being used for anything. So the idea was to use that money, which was, what, about $30 million or so? Oh, in the fund sweep? Yeah. It, it was more than that. Okay. But the the upshot was to use that for one year to protect these in-home services for uh, the affected elderly and um, disabled. Now, the governor did veto that, saying that he just didn't see this as a way to do it. And he wanted For, to, for several reasons, right. from what I remember, and you, you can back me up on this, Representative. One, he thought it was a, a short-term solution for a longer-term problem, and he Correct. thought that the way it was crafted was not constitutional. Although many of the authors agreed that it was just a short-term thing. Right. But, but yeah, it, it, it was probably unconstitutional because— I. I I don't like that after the Senate got done with it, every senator who had a, a profession that took some type of uh, fees towards those uh, accounts, um, they exempted themselves out of that. Uh, to me, it's a, that's extremely self-serving. And it, it's it, again, I agree with that, with that sentiment that it's a one-time fix for a long-term problem. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the House version, obviously. I was mm-hmm. the handler of the House version of that bill um, that was subsequently uh, changed to the budget chairman whenever it came back from the Senate with the fund sweep. Mm-hmm. Um, I voted for it on the last day of session because I did not want to be part of the problem of not having at least an option on the table. Mm-hmm. Once the governor vetoed that and, and, and made his intention clear that that was not going to be moving forward, that bill was ultimately dead. We could have overridden that veto. And it's st- the fund transfers still wouldn't have happened because the right. governor ultimately had the Correct. decision. I mean, there's a big difference between may and shall. Yes. And it said may transfer the money, not shall. There's no possibility that the governor would ever have transferred those funds. Now, uh, without – okay, there were a couple of special sessions this summer on other issues. Well, but immediately after the session, there had been, after the governor had made his comments clear within a few weeks, that he might call a special session on this – to come up with some way to keep these services going. That didn't happen. And so hasn't happened yet. Hasn't happened yet. Do, okay, now we're we're in October. So, <laughs> um, now there's some who think that they you that the general assembly might deal with this early in the regular session when they come back in January. Just sort of what do you see as the lay of the land right now on this? I think there's a very real possibility that sometime in the month of October, early November, we will be called into a special session. Uh, during veto session, we made the we made the comments uh, on the floor, both uh, both myself and the budget chairman, that we would like to actually see a solution done on this. Um, the the speaker and the Senate pro tem both came together and said, okay, we're going to have point people on this and we're going to uh, form kind of an unofficial task force. Um, that fell to uh, Representative Fitzpatrick, uh, budget chairman, and uh, Senator Cunningham. And together we've done about four conference calls, um, both Republicans and Democrats, who are kind of in the arena that, that know the logistics of the budget, that know um, the logistics of this type of population that we're trying to um, ultimately rectify. And then that is the 8,000 individuals who are now kicked off of their services because their points of acuity are not high enough. We went from 21 to 24. Mm -hmm. And the 3.5% – reimbursement rate that we're trying to get back for our in-home health care and our nursing homes in the state of Missouri. So if there is a special session, do you do you anticipate that the plan will look more like what the House wants, where you, you use the, the, the circuit breaker as a way to pay for it? Or do you think that it could be a reconfigured fund sweep. I know this is a wonky question, but I want to know what the what the plan is you've talked so far. I personally don't believe that at this point a fund sweep is a viable option for the House. I don't believe that that will make it through fruition in the Missouri House. But in at, based on the income that the state's been coming in having come in so far, do you even need that? I mean, could there be a move saying, "Look, we're bringing in more money um Therefore, we can restore this program. I mean, it, a sort of a supplemental budget thing. Is there a possibility of that or not? I think there's a possibility, but I mean, 
again, this is not the only area in the budget that is going to be need um, need addressing when, whenever we come back into January. I mean, we are already know and anticipate an eighty-three million dollar increase in the foundation formula just to hit a full funding of the foundation formula. So you take almost, you know, let, let, let's round up. You're, you're almost a hundred million dollars into that. You're going to get probably Medicaid over uh, cost overruns. You always do. Uh, we know that that's probably coming. And then, you know, you, you look at higher ed, you look at uh, public safety. There's so many other things that are going to be demanding uh, it being a call on our general revenue. And that's kind of one of the most precious things that we have in the budget committee is that that general revenue. I think when you add all those up, I'm just not sure that that is a viable option just to say, OK, well, we found some extra money in revenue on the bottom line. Um, I, I do know that currently with the task force, we have been tasked with looking at savings through, through the speaker and through the pro temp at looking at the circuit breaker tax credit. That has angered, and, and I don't think I'm, I'm talking out of line here, I, I think that has angered some of uh, my, my Democratic colleagues, um, and, and, and I get that. They would like to see a, a different revenue stream. The problem there is you, we need to be able to start counting on this money reliable mm-hmm. now. And all the other programs that they're looking at for uh, for cost savings are going to take at least a year's worth of collections in order to actually have that money in the Treasury. Whereas if you get rid of the tax credit, that's money that's not being paid out. And that's why this one, th- this tax credit is a little bit different than any other tax credits. I mean, we're, this is actually us cutting a check to these individuals. This isn't you know, like some of the other tax credits that are just in lieu of taxes. Right. So this is real cost savings that we'll have uh, day one if it were ever passed. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we can make some reductions, uh, some modifications to the program without eliminating the renter's portion. And that's always been the biggest uh, hurdle over in the Senate. The reason I asked about what the plan is going to look like is the big rule of thumb when it comes to special sessions, not only in Missouri, but I think anywhere. Like there was a, apparently like a special session in Colorado that failed because the legislators and the governor didn't really have a on this. They weren't on the same page about what the plan actually was. Right. So would you say mm-hmm. it, that in order for a special session to happen, the, the Senate and the House have to agree on what this plan is going to be, as opposed to just going into special session and debating endlessly over what it, what what the what the end result will be? I say this with just preliminary talks with the governor's staff, but I don't believe that the governor wants to call a special session unless we already have the legwork done and a general agreement of what we're going to be settling on whenever we go back into special session. I don't think that we want to drag out a session for, you know, uh, the full 90 days that a special session could go for um, debating on what we should actually do. I think um, and I think pretty much that we have a general agreement between at least the the House and the Senate leadership of what we're going to be uh, working on. And and it just may just be, you know, fine tuning it um, through the session and actually uh, hearing people's input on it. So we'll probably be looking out for that news uh, in the next few weeks. I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping for it within the next couple of days. A couple of days. I was going to say it's October, Jason. (laughs) Well, I've lost track of time, Joe. But but Joe, I'm glad I'm glad that you brought that up because even if so say 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 we this drags out and we don't actually get a, uh, a special session call because we're in you know mid November and we still don't have an agreement it just, it still doesn't mean that I'm going to stop working or Senator Cunningham or Fitzpatrick are going to stop working on this because if it does need to run up to that we have to address this in January I'd rather have a plan in place to work on the first couple of weeks in January and get this out the door by February and put an emergency clause on it to where we can act because we're still, you know, six months into a fiscal year whenever we go back into session. Mm -hmm. So there's still some real cost savings that we can get. And at the end of the day, we're trying to make sure that these 8,000 individuals get the care that they need and that it's cost effective for the state because these individuals are going to get their services they're not we're not just going to kick them out and say guess what you get no health care they're going to get their health care and it's going to be rendered in a emergency room or a hospital at dramatic cost to the state or nursing homes or I nursing mean, homes because i mean that's what i've been hearing is that many of these people especially the disabled uh would end up being forced into nursing homes because they need this care in order to stay in their home right that, that is correct and and, you know, I've already been hearing from uh, a couple of nursing homes that, okay, raising it from 21 points of acuity to 24 points of acuity doesn't do a whole lot for the nursing homes because they're just going to try every way possible 
to make sure that every individual is at 24. So are we actually getting a real representation of the level of care needed or are we kind of, uh, or, or the providers kind of looking for a way to get to 24 just so that they could be Medicaid eligible? So you kind of alluded to um, my lack of sense of what time it is. And it actually is very close to when the legislature comes back into session. Right. I think I told you that before the show and you almost fainted given how, <laughs> uh, fa- how fast time has passed. So I'm curious, what are, what are some of the other issues you think are going to be major points of discussion for the legislature? Because there were some major things passed this year. We've talked about it on the show many times, but there were also a lot of things that didn't get done. So it's a broad question, but hopefully we can uh, drill down into some specificity. Well, for, for my for my interest area, you know, obviously is the budget. Um, I, I think the real point of contention is, is enough general revenue going to be available to us in order to address our call on the on the foundation formula? And if we can restore any of the uh, of the reductions in transportation as well, because um, school districts are <sighs> I know it's especially a lot of rural school districts are still calling for that. Yeah, well, in fact, that's what I was going to ask. If if the governor and if the General Assembly and, rep- and legislators like yourself who have many rural districts within your district, if you're hearing a lot from them because transportation costs, as most of our listeners know, transportation costs in these rural districts uh, is often pretty high because their geographic <clears throat> area of the students – is pretty large in right. many cases. We have 522 school districts in the state of Missouri, and I have two districts that are in the top 25 for miles traveled by bus. So whenever you reduce all almost all of the general revenue out of the, out of the the transportation costs, uh, they're kind of looking at me going, "Yeah, we you know full funding of foundation formula, that's great, but." boy, we'd really like to get some of the transportation costs back as well because we were a high utilizer of that. I think that's going to be on the, on the forefront uh, on if we can do that. Policy-wise, um, you know, I'm always hopeful that ethics reform will move forward. Um, I think that we are, you know, coming out of summer caucus, um, the speaker, Todd Richardson, is very committed to getting that out of the House early on and fast. I think we're going to do uh, probably just a rehash of the exact same bill, get it over into the Senate with ample time again, and and hopefully put a little bit more pressure on the Senate to actually get that done. Um, and that, and also an Amendment 2 fix uh, we we're talking about as well, making sure that all the tenants of Amendment 2 are adhered by local and uh, county candidates as well as state. Because if we're going to have a set of ethics laws, we should hold our local and our ca- and our county candidates to the same standard as well. Well, let's talk about that because that's something that I have been highlighting for well over a year. Are you talking about putting campaign donation limits for county and municipal candidates? I think, I think that it will absolutely be on the table. Can I ask why, given that the Republicans have typically liked not having limits? You, be, because right now you are going to see a, a separate type of candidate in the state of Missouri. So you have your, you have your statewide candidates and you have your local and your municipal candidates. Yes, it doesn't so make sense. And also there is some very, there is some very real um, legal qu- or questions that are in limbo that the Missouri Ethics Commission has simply thrown up their hands and said, uh, we have no idea. Yeah. So take, for instance, um, uh, well, one of your one of your candidate or one of your um, uh, uh, interviewees, uh, Doug Beck, he is a state representative. He's also on the school board. Mm-hmm. Can he raise unlimited amounts of money? I think for that's the school board for the school board. But, but can can't. that school board member then make independent expenditures on behalf of other races? So there are a lot of questions. Not his own, though. I mean, not his own, but. Oh, he absolutely can make it on other Correct. races. Correct. I mean, that's right. already been decided. And I, I brought up that point, I think, about five months ago. It's it, a loophole. It, it's a pretty I don't want to say it's a substantial loophole because I don't know how many people would actually take advantage of it. But the loophole that you're talking about is, let's say, a big donor gives, let's, I'm, I'm being very hypothetical here, 15 checks of $4,999 to a city council candidate in Herman, Missouri. So that then is not picked up by the 5,000 plus uh, track around the Missouri yep. Ethics Commission. Let's just say that they get like $100,000 worth of donations. And then that person ends up running $100,000 worth of ads to help a governor candidate or a county commission candidate. Well, there's nothing in Amendment 2 that will stop that. In fact, and, I'm, and I think you would require the legislature to act 
to even make that possible, essentially. Yeah, and of course, the Representative Offerman has just given a little indirect publicity to the story that I have on uh, our website now that Jason edited and actually um, helped get a little bit of the information for, which is about uh, County Executive Steve Singer, who is a regional candidate, is not affected by the donation limits, and is legally, fairly, uh, now the state's largest recipient of, as far as the number of large donations right. because uh, county and local candidates, as the representative just said, can collect unlimited amounts. So, so many it, donors are it, getting it, money yeah, there. And, and, and you, you, know, you laid out a, a hypothetical that sounds completely ludicrous, but we've seen this happen. Chris Coster did it whenever he was attorney general. Uh, Rex Singfeld set up a thousand different packs, and he and went back when, in 2008 when we had yes. limits. It happened, and it will happen again if we do not address it. And also, to, to, to point that out, um, it, say Steve Stanger wants to run as a statewide candidate. There's nothing prohibiting him in Amendment 2 from being a county candidate, raising unlimited amounts of money, and then deciding in five months, oh, hey, guess what? I want to run statewide. And then having a huge war chest that another potential candidate who wants a startup candidate would not have that advantage. I think it's about if we're going to have standards, which we do have it now uh, because and of now Amendment it's 2. it's in the state constitution. And it's in the constitution. Let's make that applicable to all of our candidates and make sure that they're on the same playing field. I, I do want to point something out because I did follow the Ethics Commission opinion on that particular topic. I do not believe that a county candidate can convert into a yes. statewide candidate without well, giving a, a lot of the money. Yes. But I'm sure that there are many different scenarios that they could do to make sure that they have a lot of money and it's spent on behalf of their candidacy. Well, because in theory, they could transfer it into a PAC, not their own PAC, although they could, and either help others or transfer it to an independent pack or a five hundred one c four. And the, you know, yes, yes, and the independent pack or five hundred one c four, which doesn't have to report anything, could then use it on that person's behalf as long as they there, technically there, don't have any involvement. Yeah. I, I, I think what we clearly laid out is our ethics laws right now because of what has stuck, what has not stuck, how poorly written Amendment Two was. I think we can all safely say that it's a mess. Yeah, but in fact, I mean, okay, taking the devil's advocate, they acted because the General Assembly and the then Governor Jay Nixon, who was a Democrat, kept knocking it, knocking the system of no limits, but then nothing ever really got done. And I am not, I am not endorsing Amendment 2. I'm just right. saying that that's what set the the climate for Amendment 2. I don't, Joe, I don't disagree with that one bit. I, I will point out that the Governor Nixon was extremely hypocritical in that saying that I wish there was limits in and then taking 50 to a hundred thousand dollar checks days after he vetoes legislation. I think that raises suspicion and, and is incredibly hypocritical to say one thing and then do another. We're going to get back to ethics and a little <laughs> bit later in the show, but I do want to talk about another policy area that's been a big topic of discussion in St. Louis. And that is the aftermath of Jason Stockley's uh, acquittal. I'm not really going to talk with our guest about the mechanics of the case. I'm more interested in the policy uh, fallout from that, because when I've talked to many people who are, are protesting or some elected officials on the Democratic side who are sympathetic to the protest, they and I ask, like, what do you want to see from a policy standpoint? They point to a lot of things that were proposed after Ferguson. So that's independent investigations for police-involved killings. That's more uh, training for, for police. That is um, also just efforts to diversify police departments from a racial and, um, you know, even gender standpoint. Now, some of those things the legislature can't do, but some of them they can. And I'm interested to hear your take on what the legislature may or may not do, given that you came into office in 2015 when a lot of these same issues came up. Right. So. So, so yeah, you, you threw a lot, of, a lot of them at me there. Oh, um, yeah. The, the independent investigations uh, or third-party um, investigations, it, it sounds great. Um, the logistics of, of doing that are incredibly difficult. If you had a police or an officer shooting, say, in Gasconade County, um, even if you're looking at an adjacent county, you know, your, your next population center away from Herman, if you're going north to Montgomery County, you know, that's 45 minutes away. And then also, who is qualified to do so? To investigate that, I mean, we're, we're both of those counties are less than fifteen thousand people. Of those, in uh, you know, attorneys that know the law and know what is applicable to the case, 
I mean, you're you're really you're really small on your on your population that would even be able to handle that. Um, the attorney general's office has has kind of uh, weighed into this in the past. Um, they're not big fans of of doing it that way. Um, but I, I think that should be at least something that is discussed um, at the Capitol. Um, whenever we come, and maybe you know maybe there's something that I'm not seeing and it's a terrible idea, or maybe we can do it logistically. I don't know, but I think it's absolutely something that should be discussed now. Going to, you point out diversity in a, in a police department. That's a very interesting question mm-hmm. um, because, you know, it, it's kind of the uh, the argument between de facto and de jure um, segregation. You know, in Franklin or Gascony County, there are less than 50 African-Americans in the entire county of 15,000. If you if you put a requirement that there has to be so much diversity in the police department, you're simply not going to be able to, to get that. Right. I will point out that our, our police chief in the city of Herman is an African-American. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I it, it's just it, I don't think you could get to a certain threshold if you put in a percentage or something like that. It's just in rural Missouri, it's just not going to happen. And one of the things that our, our colleague Marshall Griffin has been looking at is the Missouri Highway Patrol's demographics. It's 94 percent white. I think 5 percent women as well. I'm not. Mm-hmm. But again, even if you like said you have to make it a certain percentage, which I don't think you can legally do, I don't you, you, you still have to like make the pitch to women and minorities to get them interested in joining the highway patrol, which is not always an easy option, especially when people who are interested in law enforcement may be more interested in working for a local police department, for example. I'm not sure if that's an issue that you're, you're totally familiar with, but that is something that I've heard as well for, for a statewide agency like the highway patrol. And the underlying thing that I'm a rural legislator, but Franklin County is adjacent to St. Louis County, which is not that far away from St. Louis city. Um, Honestly, I can I can say with 100 percent sincerity that I don't know all of the demands that the protesters even want. All I see on on the news and I get all the St. Louis media. All I see is that people are angry and I understand. I completely understand where they're coming from, but I don't know what it is that they want. And if that is not being communicated to someone who is in almost an adjacent county, it's certainly going to fall on deaf ears from someone from Lawrence County or Southwest Missouri. So I, I think that there, there, there obviously is a lot of anger and a lot of people that are trying to get politically motivated. But if that's not being communicated outside of St. Louis County, I don't know how effective these protests will ultimately be. And I hate to put it that way because, you know, I, 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 I absolutely understand their angst, but I don't know what they want. Yeah. So that might be something that I don't even want to say protest leaders because it seems like this is something that's happened. I don't want to say organically because there is some organization to it. But I, I think that's what some people who are prominent in this movement may have to articulate to people like you when they're talking specifically about policy. Because a lot of what they're doing is not necessarily about policy. It's about changing hearts and minds about how police interact with African-Americans. But what we're, what we're talking about here is specifically policy. And I think that that what you said might be a challenge ahead for people that support this protest. Movement. How that translates into policy in Jefferson City. Absolutely. So I do want to talk again, kind of slipping from this to ethics again. Um, one of the things that I have been following is there is this ballot initiative called Clean Missouri. It is multifaceted. I think there's about five or six different things. Yes. Um, and I might miss a couple of things here, and we'll get to this part in a minute. Um, there is open records for legislative emails and documents. There is a, a, a increase in the revolving door um, ban for when legislators can become a lobbyist. There's a lobbyist gift ban type proposal in there. And there are some fairly modest changes to campaign finance law, but they do not address what we were just talking about with Amendment 2. Right. Which, but it does require uh, that 501c4s, which are these nonprofits, which now do not have to report where their money comes from or where it goes. It does require them, if they're involved in Missouri campaigns, right. to to now to uh, report their their filings. Um, the But the thing that I think is the most impactful of this is big changes to redistricting, which is a topic that Joe and I are both intimate with because we followed the redistricting process very closely in 2011. I'm sure that you followed redistricting processes in 2019-91 as well. Oh, yeah. In fact, just so people know, <laughs> a Congresswoman Ann Wagner, frankly, 
was, in effect, pretty much in charge of the redistricting in Missouri in the early 1990s. I mean, because of her status at that point, she was very active in the Republican Party. Just FYI. So the reason I'm bringing this up is, if you listen to our last show, you know the redistricting process well because you were a staffer with the Missouri Republican Party in 2011. I know that from watching Twitter and from us talking off the cuff, you have some issues with this initiative that I would like to kind of talk about and flesh out a bit more. Absolutely. Um, there are part. I, whenever I first heard about Clean Missouri, I actually wanted to be on board. I wanted to. I, it almost sounded too good to be true, and it, it turns out, in my opinion, I do believe it's too good to be true. Um, the first and foremost, I think it is blatantly unconstitutional to group that many things together under the umbrella of ethics and, and to put it into a constitutional amendment. I think that's blatantly unconstitutional. The Constitution is pretty clear that you have to have a single subject that you're addressing, and I think you're addressing throwing uh, redistricting in under ethics. I don't think fits at all. But um, so you, you you look at some of these things. Revolving door. I, I don't have a problem with revolving door. Um, the 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 minor changes that are made on campaign finance. You know, I'm not a big fan of campaign finance, but I've also never taken in a check that's larger than I think three thousand, and I think the 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 cap there is twenty. It would lower it for legislative candidates only. Yeah, I, I, I want to make so, that clear. It's not. It doesn't affect statewide candidates. It doesn't affect PACs, and it doesn't affect local candidates. And I have a problem. I have. A, I, I do have a fundamental problem with seeing and somehow putting a less worth into a House candidate versus a Senate candidate versus a statewide candidate. I think there is a. I think that lessens the importance a, a, that people have for their local legislators when you say, "Well, you're only worth." Twenty five hundred dollars, but if you're a senator, you're so much more important. You're worth three thousand. If you're statewide, you're worth five thousand. I just I don't like that tiered system. Whatever it is, it should be applicable to all candidates, not a, on a tiered level. Okay, so, but but the, but, but this is why I'm bringing this up. The redistricting. I I I know I'm going to get some flack for saying this, but I think it needs to be said. I believe the redistricting aspect of this is by far the most important part of this initiative. In fact. I wouldn't be surprised if they put the other parts into it to make the redistricting part more yes. palatable. And I'm not saying the redistricting part is bad or I I'm not, I'm not I'll, even, I'll say it. I'm not going to even <laughs> say that that strategy is wrong, you know, of, of trying to make a proposal and the main central focus of a proposal more palatable by pairing it with other things. But explain why you think it's bad. I actually think the system that we have right now is is just fine. And Right now, we have basically um, we we have one candidate, Republican and Democrat, appointed by every congressional district for the Missouri House. They come together and they try to write draw maps. The Senate has a slate of candidates that are appointed by the uh, Republican and Democratic Party. The governor picks five out of the ten nominees, yes. and they sit together and they draw maps. Um, if they cannot come up with maps, it is drawn by the appellate judges of the state of Missouri which is why we have the House districts that we have. They were drawn 100% by the appellate judges, which was why I find it so funny when people talk about gerrymandering of the, of the legislative districts whenever they were not drawn by any partisan individuals whatsoever. They were done by appellate judges, which are for the House. nature. The for Sen the House. The Senate was drawn by a committee, and we, we can go through this very briefly. They, the, the first Senate map was found unconstitutional. The judges drew the second map that was then found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, which forced another commission to be uh, appointed, which eventually drew the map. So, and they came together on an agreement. And yeah. I think if you look at the ridiculous nature of Doug Libla's Senate district, um, that was drawn to in an agreement between the Republicans and Democrats. I think enough time's passed where I can probably talk about this. Yeah. Um, let's talk it was, about it. Was, it. <laughs> that was drawn in that was drawn specifically at the direction of Governor Nixon because he thought that putting in those two extra counties um, that kind of are kind of the tail, if if you will, of Senator Libel's district would have given um, the Democratic candidate down there, and I can't remember his name. Terry was, Swinger. Terry Swinger. Yeah. Would have given him a two point better uh, Democratic percentage. And they thought maybe that was enough to swing that district. It, uh, it clearly was not. It was not. It was not even close. Not even close. But that's why. And, it, and if you go by from a com com uh, compactness standard, I mean, it doesn't look good whatsoever. And you could have easily sw swapped in one other county and made it more compact. Okay. But that was a deal. The reason I bring that up is that 
there are deals that are cut and that both sides can come together on a map. Um, the, the way that the Clean Initiative does this is it sets up an independent panel, um, and it also puts way too much importance on a state demographer. Right. It, I've, I've been trained by the RNC. I've been trained by individuals um, of Maptitude, uh, of Caliper Corporation. I, I know demographics. I know how to do this line of work. There is no part of me that believes that you can do this uh without having some type of a slant one way or the other. So whomever the, the state demographer is, whether that is chosen by the governor or chosen by uh, I believe an independent it, panel. And this is why, this is I, and, I, and, I, and please, listeners, correct me if I'm wrong. This is how it's done. I believe the state auditor will give three nominees to the Senate Republican leader and the Senate Democratic leader. They either have to agree on one of the three or the auditor gets to pick. Now, again, I'm not trying to take a position over whether this initiative is bad or not. I do want to point out this scenario, which seems to be possible. Let's say a Republican becomes the next state auditor. From reading the, the, the language of this initiative, I don't believe there's anything to stop that Republican auditor from making Jeff Rowe, David Barklage, or John Hancock the demographer. Because and not, just so you know, those are all Republican consultants. Who are probably very well versed in how redistricting works. Each but, one of them involved in the redistricting process between 1991 and now. But Correct. none of them have been elected officials. I believe it says that right. it cannot be elected officials. And if I'm wrong about this, you can send hate mail <laughs> about it. But I feel like that is kind of a potential shortfalling of this. Absolutely. The, the, the intention of Clean Initiative, I don't, I, don't, um, I don't have a problem with. They're trying to take politics out of the redistricting process. My argument is it is absolutely impossible to do so. Even with their language, it's impossible to take politics. At least now with the system we have, you know that the five Republicans and the five Democrats have come together to draw these maps. You know what they're trying to get at. Hmm. You know exactly what they're trying to do with the, the legislative districts as well. You know where you're coming from whenever you're drawing these districts. If you try to hide under the mask of, a, oh, well, we're going to have an independent council do this, it's simply not going to happen. And I think a lot of this is going to be hashed out before this even gets to the ballot. It's going to be hashed out at the, at the national level right. with the Supreme Court saying, you know, taking up the case saying, can, uh, you know, Republican index, Democratic index of districts, can that play a factor into the districts? If, that, if they rule that it cannot be part of it, then, then it's a whole other can of worms that you open up and probably need to take a, a better look at this. Yeah, and I just want to play devil's advocate, though, on the current system because, there, because as I mentioned before, Joe and I followed this pretty closely, and I saw shortcomings of the current system, too. Like, for, for instance, for the Senate maps, you can't split counties. So you have very odd situations where West County of St. Louis County is paired with Franklin County, even though the two have very little to do with one another, when it may make more sense to have like a St. Charles and St. Louis County district, um, you know, and, th- and also you could also make the argument that judges drawing the districts is not necessarily a good thing because they probably do it in secret. They probably don't understand what they're doing most likely because they're not trained on how to draw districts. And, and it's probably clerks drawing it. And they are orders. under a lot of political pressure. And they are. I've I, mean, heard, I, mean, you, I mean, the representative just laid out one case. So, I mean, I don't know if this is particularly the initiative to do it, but would you acknowledge that the current system does have some shortcomings and may need to be reexamined? Oh, ab- ab- absolutely. But this is a coordinated effort. You're actually seeing these type of initiatives done nationwide. Um, there is a coordinated effort, and, and I'll go ahead and be the person that says it. There's a coordinated effort by uh, the national DNC to get a rein in on some of these legislative districts and how they're drawn. Um, some states have their actual legislative body draw their own maps. Um, I think that's probably not the, the route that we should go down, even though the legislator does draw, legislature rather, uh, does draw the congressional districts. Um, I, I don't think that would be the the route we want to go down. I think there could be some absolutely some some changes that are made to our current statutes as as we redistrict. But again, a lot of this is going to be dictated at what the what the 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 Supreme Court says is allowable or not. That's going to have I mean, you're talking about upending the entire system if potentially of how we've drawn districts for the past 200 years. Yes. And, and no one even, you know, back in the 1780s whenever, you know, you had your first redistricting, you're still 
having a little bit of political uh, influence into these districts. Whether you want to admit it or not, it happens. And, and one of the things in the Clean Missouri Initiative is that it has to take, and, and I may be paraphrasing your partisan fairness into account, which which may actually be what ends up happening if the Supreme Court rules that partisan redistricting is unconstitutional. So in some sense, I don't want to say it's redundant, but they may actually achieve their goal without doing anything if the Supreme Court decides that's how it should be done. But that's that... In essence, that is the most asinine way of drawing districts, and I believe it's almost impossible. Jason, how do you draw a district, a congressional district? So say, say that we're, we're talking about congressional districts. Yeah. How do you draw a competitively, competitively fair Republican 50 percent, Democrat 50 percent with St. Louis County or St. Louis City? Unless you draw that district going from St. Louis City through Franklin County— or maybe through St. Charles, you're not going to get a 50-50 district. I don't think you, by the population of where they where they nest themselves, I don't think you can. And I and I and I think that that's one of the issues for Democrats going forward. We can talk more broadly now about kind of the challenge ahead. I know you're a Republican, but it kind of goes into the the challenge for Democrats. The Democratic populations in the state are basically clustered in Kansas City, St. Louis, and to some extent Columbia. Although Columbia mm-hmm. is getting a lot more, the Boone County is getting a lot more Republican. So the problem for Democrats on a state legislator level and on a congressional level is even if you have a system that may make redistricting more advantageous for them, it's going to be very difficult to find districts of 35,000 people and 125,000 people where you get enough Democrats to make it competitive in some of the rural parts of the state where they've completely right. collapsed. Yeah, you're, you're, you know, I, I understand if, you're, if you've been in the minority party this long, um, you, you would like to see something change that maybe would be advantageous to your party. But, you know, Franklin County, I would I would I will gladly give up uh, my district to the hands of the Democrats. I would say, go ahead and try to draw a Democratic district. It's just not going to happen. I mean, I think every state is different. I mean, but in Missouri, yes, Missouri very much. It's the way the population is. It's very much part. I mean, partisan i mean just it just is and you're not going to get a republican district in in st louis city and i understand that so i don't understand if you draw the legislative districts differently how that is going to be advantageous for one party over the other i think you still probably get the same uh the same breakdown no matter how you draw the districts well i appreciate this rousing uh discussion (laughs) about redistricting it is one of the topics that believe it or not i get most excited about (laughs) and we've run out of time and that's why we have (laughs) podcasts about it so uh, for all of our stories stlpublicradio.org follow me on twitter at jay rosenbaum follow joe on twitter at jay manis that's j-m-a-n-n-i-e-s and you can follow the representative on twitter at uh justin alf j-u-s-t-i-n-a-l-f sorry for interrupting but we'll be back next time until then so long The Gateway brings you the day's news from the St. Louis region and across Missouri. It also includes stories from the Illinois side of the river and our Metro East reporter, Will Bauer. In Alton, in Belleville, in East St. Louis, in Edwardsville, in Cahokia Heights, at Scott Air Force Base, I'm Will Bauer, St. Louis Public Radio. Listen to reports from Will and all of our journalists weekdays on The Gateway, on the STLPR app, and wherever you get podcasts.